Welcome, welcome to Massey College and welcome to the Music Club at Massey College. I'm so happy to see you all here, both in place, in, in person and also uh, virtually. So I want to uh, welcome you to this place. Uh, Massey College is built on indigenous lands and it is the land of the Yorongwanda, the Seneca, and it is a treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. On your behalf and on all of us, I think we want to acknowledge our continued duty of stewardship toward this land and also the privilege that we have to continue to be here. So I just want to say how happy I am and welcome to our special guest, uh, Jeremy. And we're so uh, uh, honored to have you here. So I'm looking forward to the event. And without further ado, let me uh, pass it to our uh, director of the music club no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Anna. Oh, oh, it's okay. I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you, Natalie, for the land acknowledgement and introduction to tonight's Massey Music Salon. So, a warm welcome to you, to everyone here, also all of you who are joining us online. Uh, my name is Hannah Chan Hartley. I'm a musicologist also a Quadrangle Society member of Massey College and host of tonight's event as one of the members of the programming committee for the Massey Music Society. And since it's the first event of the year, I just briefly want to tell you about um, the Massey Music Salons. So the Massey Music Salons are a series of evening events open to all in the community that explore the creation and performance of music in all its facets. Programming is eclectic, ranging from new visions for opera in the 21st century to indigenous voices and contemporary Canadian music, and from the ancient musical traditions of the Indian subcontinent to the influence of hip hop music and culture on our world today. These events are planned by the Massey Music Society, a committee of junior and senior fellows, alumni, and Quadrangle Society members. And each evening is a blend of live or recorded performance along with discussion and interaction. Invited presenters include highly talented members of the Junior and Senior Fellowship, as well as creative leaders from the wider community. And tonight we're really pleased to have 2018 Polar uh, Polaris Prize winner Jeremy Dutcher join us in conversation with Canadian music historian, author, and journalism fellow alum Michael Barclay. Jeremy will talk about his musical journey and his mission to restore the language and culture of his people, the Willis Tukwik or Maliseet of New Brunswick to their rightful place. He will also introduce clips from a sensational debut album, Willis Tukwik, Lintu Wagan, <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> pronounce it, Lintu Wag, Lintu Waganawa? Yes. Close, <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> with, I love learning this, it's <laughs> new for me. Which fuses the voices of his ancestors with classical jazz and electronic influences. A member of Tobik First Nation in New Brunswick, Jeremy Dutcher is a performer, composer, activist, and musicologist. Roles all infused into his art and way of life. His music also transcends boundaries, notable for its unapologetic playfulness in its incorporation of classical influences, reverence for the traditional songs of his home, and the teeming urgency of modern day struggles of resistance. Michael Barclay is the author of the acclaimed 2018 national bestseller, The Never Ending Present, the story of Gord Downey and the Tragically Hip, and co-author of Have Not Been the Same, the Can Rock Renaissance from 1985 to 1995. He was chief copy editor at McLean's from 2008 to 2017, associate producer at CBC Radio 2's Brave New Waves from 2003 to 2006, and a freelance writer for the Globe and Mail, the New York Times, Exclaim, I Weekly, and others. For almost 20 years, he had a weekly column in the Waterloo Region record. His latest book, Hearts on Fire, Five Years That Changed Canadian Music, 2000-2005, was published earlier this year. And I don't want to take any time away from their, what will be a fantastic conversation. So please welcome Jeremy and Michael. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. That was a great introduction. Thank you very much. Um, some people here will know what Jeremy does. Um, we do have some clips that we wanted to show. Are you okay with this? I mean, yes. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> we had a whole plan. I meant to tell you the plan. Did I tell you the plan? We didn't. No, let's okay. do it. But right. in front of everyone seems like the, the, the perfect place to, to run through a game we were gonna What do you got? Show, I definitely want to show the video for uh, Chandler Levac's beautiful video. Isn't that? Yeah. Uh, 
but I was going to open with your Juno performance. Are you okay with that? Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> let's do it. All right. I love let's, it. Let's roll the Juno performance. This is 2019. Yeah. I think. Yes. It is. Yeah. A long time ago. Eh? Three years. Wow. Yeah. And a lot less hair. For who? You or me? Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> let's find out. Roll the tape. Roll the tape. Let's did it. You don't need to applaud. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Um, wow, that's a trip. That was three years ago. You haven't seen it since then, I guess. I mean, yeah. I mean, sure. why would you? Like, eh? Why would you? Yeah, I'm yeah. not going back and like <laughs> checking it out, but um, I'm very proud of that little moment. Mostly, I got that, like my parents were there and my little niece was actually front row. And what? she also got to carry my, uh, the, the train of my cape on the red carpet. Oh, nice. So this kind of, this kind of shit, I was like, so happy I got to do that. What city was it in that year? This was in London, Ontario. Oh, glamorous. Glamorous London, Ontario. <laughs> I loved it. It was, it was a really good time. Um, okay. That city held us well. And also, you know, getting to meet people like uh, Sarah McLaughlin and <laughs> Sting and like uh, Jan Art. I don't know. It was just like, it, yeah. was, it was music royalty back there. And yeah. I was just like, I was soaking it all up. Nice. Um, but yeah, that was also the biggest kind of uh, stage I'd played before, mm -hmm. too. I think even still. Um, so, you yeah. know. I, uh, 
I think you, your album came out in April 2018, <laughs> and four months later, uh, you won the Polaris Prize, and you gave what to me is a top five acceptance speech of all time. It was very moving. I was oh, watching it again you. this week. I cried again. Oh, for real. Yeah. In your speech, you opened with, uh, you said, Canada, you are in the midst of an indigenous renaissance. Are you ready to hear the truths that need to be told? Are you ready to see the things that need to be seen? And you concluded with, this is all part of a continuum, continuum of indigenous excellence, mm -hmm. and you are here to witness it. I welcome you. Hmm. Is that what I said? That is what you say. <laughs> <laughs> there are some thank yous and oh my gosh, this is amazing. Best yeah, 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 yeah. But, but you really got the check. heart of it. That's yeah, a just, proper paraphrase there, my friend. Right. Wow, you're, you're good at this. I was there, uh, it was a beautiful <laughs> thing. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Um, yeah, I, um, I actually had, a, I had planned a little bit, like typed some notes on my phone about what I was gonna get up there and say. And believe it or not, as soon as I opened up my note, it deleted itself. <laughs> Probably. Like I was about to pick it up and go on stage and it just went <laughs> <laughs> all gone. Yeah. And I was just like, okay, the spotlight's on you. You need to go now. So yeah. I just spoke from the heart, I guess. Yeah. And um, that's what came out. Um, I don't, yeah. I was just naming something that I was, that, that I f felt pretty apparent. Yeah. Which is like um, the, the rate in which indigenous voices are coming forward in this moment and, 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 and what they're offering right now I think is really something we need to look towards, you know? And it's not, it's not something new, we're in the midst of it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that must be uh, iterated and reiterated all the time. Do you, uh, do you remember what you were doing five years ago this month? Oh my goodness, first of all, what is this month even? What are we, <laughs> <laughs> October, 20, right? 2017. Yeah. More specifically, what were you getting ready to do in November 2017? Wait, do you know? And yes, I do. Okay, I'm, I'm Brian Lineheining you here. I'm trying to... Wow. Uh, I don't like this game. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't have a good memory like that. Tell um, me about the new Constellations. Story. Oh, right. Okay. Well, uh, uh, so this is... Sorry about that. I'm no, sorry. it's oh, all good. It's all good. But um, it just feels like... It, it truly, it was a lifetime ago, right? Because that, that I feel like that would be a lesson to a lot of people. First time, first time I ever heard. Like, right. really, my introduction to myself, I didn't know what I was doing. I had just come out of music school. Um, I had done this little research project at the museum at the behest and request of my elder, um, who, you know, informed me about, you know, those old voices that you kind of heard in that performance. Um, she encouraged me to go to that museum and, and, and kind of dig around and bring it back, bring it out, like, and show people how beautiful it is. Because truly, you know, when you go and you listen to those old voices or you, or you see those old photographs or you look at the regalia from that time, it's so beautiful. And so what I tried to do is just a reflection of, of that beauty and tried to show our young people, like, what our language holds, you know, and, and how beautiful our ways are. And, um, that's all it was, and, and this is, so this is all before that though, and the New Constellations was like the first getting to go and share that with people, um, which was a little nerve wracking. I'd never been on a tour bus before. I didn't know what that was like. <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there's ups and downs to it all, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it was getting to share a stage with people I really freaking admire, you know, uh, A Tribe Called Red, mm -hmm. um, Feist mm -hmm. was also a part of that tour, uh, Lido Pimienta, there was just, there were so many people a, a part of that tour that have just now been part of my life and, and, and friends, and, and so I'm just like ever grateful for that. You so know? that tour was meant to be kind of a, a, a dialogue, a, a kind of, um, it had a lot of Canadian kind of rock music royalty, like Leslie Feist, uh, yeah. July Talk, uh, yeah, Joel right. Plaskett, Stars, Sam Roberts, uh, it had writers like Desmond Cole. Well, I was just gonna say, even the literary, even the format and the literary component, like matching, matching that, like those like literary greats. Uh, Naomi Klein yeah. also came out for the yeah. show in Thunder Bay. Just like there are so many amazing voices as part of that, and to match it with the music, I just was like, we need to be doing that more and more and more and more. Like, why, mm -hmm. why are we separating our art out and saying like, oh, we're just gonna have a night of music? Yeah, can, <laughs> I a, can I get a Tahoe? Yeah. Um, you know. So anyway, I just think it was it was a really cool evening of word and song and yeah. And then there was also a tribe called Red. There was also Elisipi. Oh. There was also oh yourself. There was um, uh, Leonard Sumner. There was. Uh, yeah, you got it. 
and, and so I feel like a year later when you win the Polaris and you talk about this indigenous renaissance, that's what was happening on that tour. And I feel like that was something that people had talked about for a long time. They talked about Tribe Called Red, they talked about Tanya Tagak, and you know, Buffy St. Marie put out a comeback record during that period as well. But then this was like, this is the new generation. And every review, I reread re the reviews of that tour today. Okay. And Wait, there's reviews of that tour? Yes, there are. I really gotta Google that. Like, <laughs> I wonder what they're saying. I mean, it's too late now. The show's done. The show's <laughs> done, but apparently time. there was a documentary by Tracy Deer being shot. And I'm oh, very yeah, curious remember, what happened with that. I remember there was a documentary on a bus. I don't know. <laughs> it's always weird. You know, you're just there to go and like perform and do your job. And then somebody's like coming up to you on a bus with a, like a camera in your face and it's like, oh, I, I didn't, I don't think I want to be, I don't know, I don't even know what happened to that. You were part of history, Jeremy, that's what I'm trying to say. Sure, well, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll tip a hat to that. Someone was nice enough to invite me along, I don't know who did that, but yeah, um, yeah it, it felt like, it felt like a, a shift when we were, not only were we sharing that stage, but we were, we were bringing something that was like, electric that mm -hmm. was like something new and something when 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 our languages are present I think it's vibrational you know it's like mm -hmm. we haven't heard what what you know every kind of music sounds like through that lens so like let's try it out let's mm -hmm. see it you right. know and that's what you know uh, Tribe Called Res as a, an example just one example but like a very salient one for myself seeing how they incorporated so seamlessly uh, our, our songs, our traditions, our languages into a very established genre like EDM, mm -hmm. you know? This is one example, and, uh, you know, when you see it, it's like, oh yeah, we can do that too. I can take this kind of like weird classical music that I've been studying at school and, you know, maybe I can infuse myself into it mm -hmm. and find a pathway that's speaking to both realms. And not, not elevating one over the other, because I think so often too, in the world of classical music, they'll like, you know, we'll take a melody or we'll, you know, we'll like, you know, put a drum in our, in our orchestra, but right. it's like, well, that you're not really, you, you're, you're like, oh, isn't that, it's, it's still uh, patronizing in a way, right? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's keeping that, that power dynamic, it doesn't change that at all, right? But when we actually start to equalize that playing field a bit and, and, and understand that all musics have pedigree and all musics have lineage, and everyone has classics. Like even the even a term like classical music is so fraught and like um, drenched in the society which we are you know inhabiting right now. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, I think we're all trying to like find a better way of going forward, dreaming ourselves into a better you know future. So a tribe called Red, who started out as it was a DJ night in Ottawa. Yeah, and they started. Um, doing, this is around the time of dubstep, and they, were, they did what they called powwow step and would take powwow recordings and mix it with dance music. Um, and you talk about that being inspirational for your own melange, but can you are there other examples that you can think of that did that? I mean, I know that, that uh, Buffy would occasionally incorporate some of that into her uh, rock music. Oh yeah. Um, and wh what other ones stood out for you when you were kind of figuring out what you wanted to do with your own music? I mean, there, I think there are many, but I'm curious which ones. Resonate. Yeah, I mean, huh. It, 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 at the particular intersection of like classical music and indigenous music, there's people like Chris Dirksen as well, mm -hmm. that I think we've been doing that work for, you know, longer than I have and somebody I looked to and, and thought, oh yeah, wow, that's amazing. Um, but even, you know, uh, the references go as broad as Nina Simone, you know, somebody like that and the ways in which she told stories mm -hmm. about her people mm -hmm. and, you know, was reflecting the conversations of her time in her music. I feel like that's, that's a heavy inspiration too because, you know, as much as it's an album about, uh, you know, bringing those old voices forward and museum uh, rematriation and that, that all that work that needs to happen around complicating the museum and all that, it's also about language, you know, and it's about, you know, the fact that we do have less than 100 fluent speakers left of Ulustigwe language. Why is that? It, you know, it didn't get up and walk away. Like, uh, there's reasons why. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if we put half the energy that we put into eradicating these languages as a society, mm -hmm. you know, what could we do to protect them and what could we do to ensure that they're gonna get passed on? So I'm curious about these kind of things and I think um, for me, especially in this last, you know, year and a bit, 
when you know music was kind of deemed unessential, <laughs> you have the crisis of the work. Like, well, what am I? What am I doing if I can't go out and do uh, what I thought I was here to do, which is you know perform for people or or give people music in a live way? Um, so you know, finding a pivot and finding a way to honor what that work can be not just a direct exchange of like mm. me doing a concert and giving music, but mm -hmm. you know, uh, institution building, like what do, we need, what do we need right now in our community to get strong in order that we might um, you know, heal and uh, show the way. You how, know? Do you, how do you manifest that? You oh, I, nobody does individually. It's but a you, you've been doing this the last couple of years. You're saying when you pivot away from music a bit. So what? I'm just trying to give. Yeah. So there's a very special project that's happening right now um, in our territory in in New Brunswick, um, and it's um, basically with with what's happening with our language because our language has been identified as a severely endangered language, um, and that's been since I was a kid too. So this was like. This was kind of the, the water that I was raised in was that, you know, your language is dying <laughs> and it's up to you kids uh, to save it and protect it, you know, so get to work. Uh, and that's like a burden for sure, but it's a, it's a great responsibility as well and something um, that I think a lot of us young people uh, like in Willestowig, we lived into. Like there's so many language warriors right now and, and this album and my work is, is only a piece of that for sure. Um, but it was my kind of contribution as a music maker, as somebody who was um, thinking about sound and, and what song can do is, is to try to throw my hat into the ring of like, yeah, um, you know, there's, <laughs> there's one particular elder who says, oh, we're never going to save our language through song. You know, you can't, you can't, just, you know. <laughs> and yeah, you know what, maybe not, but uh, mm. why don't we try? Right. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't believe that there's a total answer, you know. I think there's like many approaches to that, to that work of, of revitalization and keeping our language strong. And, and so m what do I bring to the table as, a, as somebody with a, with a skill set around sounds? You know, for me, that's music. And so this is my little offering to that so movement. So your skill is music. You're singing these lyrics. I'm curious because obviously yeah. I don't know. That's okay. Are you singing... Uh, <laughs> Are you singing the traditional lyrics? Are you adding your own lyrics in, in, in yeah. new material? Are you writing in this language? Oof, yes. All, okay, okay. Th that, was, that was three very good questions. So, so let me... Let sorry, me, I triple barrel do. Yeah, that's okay. Let me try to yeah. see if I can... <laughs> it's been a while since I've done interviews now. I, that's <laughs> like, let me see if I can get this. So, okay. Um, are the new lyrics on the album? Or are they all traditional? Okay, yeah. So a lot of them, because they're based on those like archival songs, those like wax cylinder recordings, mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are just w like syllable for syllable what I'm hearing right. as I'm listening to right. those. Um, some of them are lyrics that make sense to me as a, as a, as a language speaker. Mm -hmm. Some of them were, didn't make sense to me at all. So I would even take them to elders and say, hey, like, what is this? Do you mm -hmm. know what this says? Right. Even, even some of them would say, oh, no, 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 no. That's old language. That's old language. Right. That's, uh, I remember even one said, oh, that's sky language. That's which? Sky language mm -hmm. that they're singing in. And um, so I was very interested by that. And because, you know, and it was kind of I was talking to uh, one of the linguists in our territory and he was saying, well, it's because since we're a primarily oral language, language changes really, really quick, right. you know? And these recordings are over 110 years old. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of our elders will recognize it, but even they'll say it's like, that's, even that's an old way of speaking, right. you know? So it was kind of cool to get in there. So I digress. Um, some of them were, was it, it was old language, yeah. you know? So I didn't sometimes even know what it was. Others, I very much knew what it was. Excuse me. Is that any different than opera in German or Italian? Well, this, or is, this is kind <laughs> of how I justified it in my head, was like, you know, um, well, you know, I mean, as a, as, a, as a responsible music practitioner, we always need to know what we're singing about, you know? Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> else we're gonna lead the audience astray. Um, so, uh, you know, I, even without a conscious understanding of the, what was being sung, I made it my business to know mm -hmm. everything I could about those songs. So, for example, um, there was very limited metadata when I was doing the research <laughs> about these songs, you know. Um, but often I had a title to go off. Mm -hmm. Like, what was this song for? Right. You know, They're functional songs. Right? Well, uh, I, 
True, like, of course, yeah. I think it kind of gets at the root of what is a song, right? Because I think we've come in this society, in this space, to think of it as entertainment, <laughs> right. you know, or something we go and we sit and then we clap at the end, and, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Um, but I think, especially in an oral society where storytelling is so much a part of every day, um, and also, too, like work songs, like, it, you know, songs on the land, like half those songs are water songs, because we're, we're Willistuig, we're people of the river, so mm -hmm. we're using our canoes and we're going down that river, mm -hmm. and so you can almost hear the, the motion of that water in those archives. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, they're all kind of ut utility songs about, about the world around us. Mm -hmm. Um, so I tried to honor that in a compositional way as well, you know, how I'm framing these songs. Um, with new material, like, um, because on my next record I'm not really, I didn't want it to be pigeonholed as like the archive person, right. you know, okay. so I'm not really, as much as I could use, I could make like seven albums based on all of these songs, because there was over 110 that were collected, right? right. I only used 11 on, yeah. that, on that first record. but. Anyway, I, I just wanted to use more than just that little archive, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm now incorporating a lot of poetry, a lot of like, uh, uh, a lot of beautiful new texts in our language, you know, writing stuff in our language too. So there's a lot of possibilities there. And our words are so complex, you know? We have a, a poly, um, Forgive me if there's linguists here. <laughs> <laughs> there might be. Uh, there well there very well <laughs> might be. So just somebody pipe up if this is wrong. Uh, I believe it's called polysynthetic or polymorphic language, much, much like German in the yeah. fact that the, 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 the words are almost like building blocks, yeah. you know, and you're like building really complex long words that are, you know, shaping around an idea. So, you know, a, a sentence might be one or two words. You know, but they're really, they're, they're containing a lot. So it, they're, they're sometimes, they're difficult languages to learn. And I also want to commend you so much for, <laughs> for putting your hat in the ring and just trying it and, you know, getting it wrong and trying again. And that's, I think that's all, all we can ask in, in this moment right now is just to try and to have kindness with each other is because, you know, there's a reason that these words are foreign to our mouths, mm -hmm. right? right? I think we very well could have lived a different history here mm -hmm. in this place where this would be the language of every day. Oh, how I wish. <laughs> oh, how I wish. Because You're working on it. Well, we would <laughs> just, well, yeah, listen, I'm not, I now live in Quebec too, so oh. it's like I, there's a whole oh. different experience of, uh, of how language politics can work yeah. in a society. Especially this month. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what's this month? Well, there's an election three weeks ago. Oh, yeah, 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 right, yeah. <laughs> Vote. <laughs> <laughs> what were we talking about, Michael? Many things. <laughs> um, we were talking about how few people speak the language. Oh, yeah. Uh, but your, both your parents did? Sure. Your, I really your tried aunt was a teacher. My aunt's a teacher for sure. And like, uh, I really try not to focus on how few people speak the language, you know, because right. I think it's like as interesting and as like, um, as. Uh, like uh, fire inducing as it is, you know, mm -hmm. to think about how few people do it. I also think it, 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 it makes a lot of people throw their hands up and say, well, why try it then? Right. You know, if it's like, mm -hmm. you know, if there's so few, like what good does it do? But also I was trying to, I was trying to research this today too, about yeah. the context of that language versus other Algonquian languages oh, yeah. or Abnaki or, or Mi'kmaq. Totally. And so today I learned that the Mi'kmaq people call it, sorry, I'm <laughs> liking. Oh my God, I love Mislin? this. No, you went, you went in deep. Yeah, you Malicies. went in deep. Yeah, Malice. Which apparently in Mi'kmaq means broken language. Well, this is the thing. We don't use this anymore. It's a <laughs> tad of a slur. Um, uh, no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. It is. I, um, but it seems marginalized within that linguistic group too, no? Oh, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's a numbers game, to be honest, right. too. Um, yeah. The Mi'kmaq, they, they've got us by, I, I think, threefold uh, <laughs> population-wise. Yeah. So they, they, you know, and the and the the hegemonic tends to tell the story, yes. right? So, um, yeah, it's even funny enough. I was I was I spent like a couple weekends ago with with a group of young Mi'kmaq people, all kind of speaking their language, and they they called me a Maliseet, and I said, yeah. uh, 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 uh. <laughs> we had to do a little. Well, I think it's you know we're in this time when naming is important, and how people name themselves is is we gotta respect that, you know, mm. when somebody's reaching out and trying to teach you a little something about their reality and where they come from, 
I think we got to meet that in good faith, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm not a broken talker, you know? Like <laughs> <laughs> my language is beautiful. And, yeah. and when, we, when we talk about Wolustuk, I can teach them about that beautiful river that starts at St. Lawrence River and goes all the way to the ocean. Mm -hmm. And you know, I can tell them that we are Wolustuk, we are the people of that river and mm -hmm. everything that that means, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and isn't that a much more beautiful way to connect a people to their land than saying, because where it came from was when Europeans showed up, they talked to the Mi'kmaq and they said, hey, who are those people over there? <laughs> right. And they said, you know, sometimes our neighbors get a little shady on each other, yeah. you know, and they said, oh yeah, those are the broken talkers over there. <laughs> anyway, 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 I digress. But it is true, like, as you were, as you were kind of pointing it to you in your question, um, the, the, the family of languages right. on the East Coast yeah. is really, there's a huge connection. And so this is also what gives me kind of like, a, a strong faith for the future because we're not reinventing the wheel. Like there's a lot of, a lot of work happening on all fronts. Um, and then, yeah, also not get too caught up in the numbers game of it either, mm -hmm. right? Because I think um, when we do that, we've already lost, right. you know? It's more about being, I guess, solution oriented mm -hmm. and thinking like, okay, well, what can, what can we do right now in this moment to ensure that that's not the case, mm -hmm. you know, um, rather than thinking about that as a foregone conclusion. So for me, it's about where we point the camera or where the lens is, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about um, this beautiful initiative that's happening right now. And uh, it actually just opened up two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago now, um, which is the very first Willistigwe Immersion School. Oh, wow. um, yeah! <laughs> Woo! It is exciting. It's super exciting. Uh, started by my mom, so <laughs> also super excited about that. Um, yeah, give it up for, yeah, give it up for moms. Um, no, she's an incredible lady, and to go from, uh, you know, uh, uh, a place where the language actually represented a lot of trauma for her, right? Like going to those schools and, mm -hmm. and having, having speak to, to speak that language meant of violence against you that right. was, um, yeah, no child should ever have to <laughs> endure. And, and, and it created this sense of like, oh, I just don't, I, I won't speak then, right? And so Shame. there's this whole generation of what we call silent speakers. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of adults and kind of early elders that are, are fluent in our language, mm -hmm. but are, are really reticent to speak because, and my, this is my mom's experience, she says, you know, when I, when I go to speak sometimes, I, speak, I feel like I speak like a six-year-old. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like that's when my language was stopped. Right. And so, um, for a long time, it was just like I didn't want to. I didn't want to speak it, you know, just because I didn't feel like I could really express who I was. Even though it's her first language, it's what she heard the most for the first, you know, many years. And as 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 linguistics people know, uh, the, those those early years of what you hear is very very critical to to how you function in the world, right. and and your worldview and how you see the world. So, mm -hmm. um, to go from that place to now creating. This is kind of exactly what I'm saying. You know, like it's like the institution building right. of, of preparing a path. There was like no place that I could go and, and sit at a school and learn my language. Mm -hmm. I just had to go and listen to elders and try to like write it out. And then we finally got a dictionary like 10 years ago. So right. that's been an amazing resource, but it's, yeah. been, a, it's been a slog, let me right. tell you. Yeah. Um, so I'm really happy that now there's like, there's, there's spaces and places that uh, you know, that language is not being honored, you know? Speaking of institutions, yeah. I think there's a good spot to break and yeah. play the video yeah. oh, for sure. measurement. Yeah, you got it. Uh, shot at the Aga Khan Museum uh, in Toronto by- uh, Beautiful there. Did you go? I have not yet been. Oof. I know, we've had massy things. I'm sorry I haven't been yet. That's okay. <laughs> but no, 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 no shame <laughs> to you. No shame to you at all. But I will, I will say, when you do get to go, yeah. it's, it's an absolutely stunning place. They have great music programming there too. Yeah. yeah, and they really flung their doors open for us and just like let us take it over nice. with, our, with our amazing table of indigenous excellence. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, we'll get to it. I want to watch Let's it. Show. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
office from protests and shit and just like putting them over the song. So that's not really, like this was the only <laughs> video that I've done. The other one was very DIY. Right. But uh, yeah, this was the first like big budget, you know, we gotta like have a schedule and there's like a, a snack table and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> It was nice. It was fun. Well, I I'm think just, I'm just trying to imagine all those people in the room, like having conversations with Tantu Cardinal with Alanis Obabswin, like. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, Tantu, we got to have a, actually a quite a few interactions because she was part of that dance scene, and yeah. so we got to rehearse right. together and really just have like a, a lovely, a lovely, lovely time. Um, Alanis, you know, um, she comes in on the day, and that's it, and yeah. <laughs> um, but it's very quick. But she is amazing, yeah. and like. Um, I mean, I've been watching her film since I was a little mm -hmm. a nugget. So, um, yeah, it was just like all of those people I, I was so inspired by. And I think why I wanted to shoot the video in that way and have that table was because I think after the year of the, after the Juno year and the Polaris thing, mm -hmm. like all of these awards where it's like, okay, you are now, here's your gold ribbon, like right. uh, number one. <laughs> uh, I just, I think that's such a sick way of, <laughs> 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 of like quantifying what music is. Right. And I think, um, sorry, not to say that I don't want another one. I'm <laughs> saying, <laughs> but I'm just saying like it's, if we must do it that way, it's yeah. like a little weird. Yeah. Um, so because, yeah, I think to, to, to shine that light or to pedestal one artist to say like, this is mm. better than the rest. Yeah. It's just like kind of missing the point of what we're doing here, which is like everyone's kind of unfurling their own thing. And, you know, it might not look like what y you did or what you did or what you did, but it's going to be an offering. Right. right. And, and let's meet that for, for what it is. And right. So like each one of those people at that table, it, they might not have won a big award or, or might not have ascended to the highest. You know, they might not be an Elanisa Bamsawin, but each one of them is doing something in my mind, world changing for their own people. Right. You know, so uh, to, to to spotlight that and to show that was 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 something I really wanted to do with that video. Right. Yeah. Um, I had a question about institutions again. So you, when you're making the record, you yeah. go to sorry, which museum in Ottawa is it? So I guess <laughs> I think when I put in the application, it was called the Museum of Civilization, right. and then by the time it came through, it was <laughs> called the Museum of Canadian History. Right. Thanks, Stephen Harper, right. for <laughs> making that very necessary change um, <laughs> to the name of some museum in Gatineau. Um, so, and, and these, <laughs> these recordings were made by an anthropologist who, my understanding is he came and lived among the Wollastook for seven years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So not total carpetbagger, but like... Sure enough, no, he yeah. showed up and he, yeah. uh, he had like, uh, he had trust in it, like, I guess they called them informants in Ooh. the community, people that like <laughs> would take him around and, yeah. and, and so he learned a lot and it, he wasn't even just looking at music as well, he was really trying to, s to I don't know, they, they're like, y'all were very interested in us for a very long time. <laughs> It's 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 fair enough. We were very beautiful and and uh, and uh, had a lot of interesting things that didn't look like European culture. Right. Um, so they wanted to catalog us and know us, you know. But it's uh, I, in a weird way, I'm grateful they did. But also in a weird way, I was like, ew. Like I was just gonna say, it's very complicated. It's not like yeah. it's not the old kind of like take the artifacts and run away with them to the museum. There is an investment, and they are there for you now to access. Yeah. And yet, well, it's still wrapped up in. That's the thing, you know, I think for me the whole question was around accessibility and how, and still it's kind of an open question, is how do we ensure, because when I was growing up I didn't know anything about those archives, right. you know, it was not something that was readily knowledgeable or accessible to the people, so for me that's a real problem, because then who is it for? Is yeah. it just for a ticket paying audience that can go in Ottawa to go see that museum? Yeah. Uh, then it's, that's, that for me is immoral. <laughs> and not really yeah. doing its job, right? Yeah. Um, so in my mind, you know, um, in that context, and two, when, because it goes back to what they have in there, too, because it's... What, what do they, they have in there? What, well, like, it really <laughs> runs the gamut, right? Like, and, and what they would say was there, there'll, there'll be artifacts, you know? But, yeah. but for us, that's like, there's, those are drums, those are, those are our clothing um, that, that our artisans have made. Um, those are canoes. Those are, um, sometimes it's like human remains and shit, too. So it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it can be a very fraught space, you know? It's not mm -hmm. just as, as simple as, uh, and when we, 
because all of those things I just mentioned, like those, those objects, those things that get objectified in the museum, um, like, our, like our ceremonial items, um, those for us in our language, they're all animate. They're all mm -hmm. living, right? So if we, if we think of them as relatives, then those museum spaces look more like incarceral spaces. Or zoos. Yeah, right? And so like, who is that for? Mm -hmm. And like, why now have a lot of our, our, our design patterns, you know, passed on or died out, mm -hmm. right? It's because people don't have access, right? And so like, in my mind, I'm interested in, in connecting our young artisans, our young people, or really, <laughs> all of our people because uh, I really do believe at any point we can tap into an artistic mm -hmm. way so I think that is all therapy and healing for all of our people to get a chance to touch what our ancestors touched to see how they stitched to, s to, to understand like there's such a deep beauty that's not bought at H&M <laughs> you know <laughs> that was here and that comes from our way mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry to H&M <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not They're not a sponsor, I'm don't worry. Okay. Oh, <laughs> good. Even if they were. Oh, gosh. Uh, what were we talking about? Museums. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. And, and yet, I guess I'm kind of on the inside now. The Museums and Archives Canada has just gave me a scholar award this year. So What does that mean? Does that uh, I don't money? know what that means. I, I guess that means I, uh, <laughs> I can go and break in whenever I want. Um, <laughs> well, no, but I think we do. <laughs> And what I'd hoped to start conversations with this first album was about what rematriation or repatriation actually even looks like, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. um, why should those be living in that museum? Mm -hmm. Why should they be asserting ownership over these things that are, that's not your culture, this is, these, are, these are songs that are mm -hmm. in my language that tell our stories, like mm -hmm. this should be back with our people. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole ethos behind that first record was that transmission of mm -hmm. saying, no, 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 no. You know, I don't want to, I don't want this anymore, mm -hmm. you know, and I want to create music so that, you know, our young people can turn on a radio, you know, mm -hmm. go on CBC and hear something in their language. Mm -hmm. That's n something I didn't have. I, I wanted to ask about your education. So you, uh, you taught yourself to play piano. Yeah. Mm. And then, bad idea? Good idea? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, it simply is. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I fought a lot with myself about this because in the early days, you get kind of propped up as this, like, you know, you're a piano musician. Right. And it's like, oh, there are people. In my own family, there's people that play that instrument better than I do. Right. So it's like, what on earth kind of... Uh, but you went to school for voice then, right? Is sure, yeah. Right? I should say I did go to music okay. school, <laughs> and it's not like I just like yeah. uh, rolled out of bed and was good at music. Right. No. Um, <laughs> I did, uh, I worked at it. Yes. Um, <laughs> but particularly on the, on the piano side of things. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was all kind of just feeling it out, what mm -hmm. sound good, what sound bad. Mm -hmm. um, well, what, what made you want to study voice? Um, Were you in love with the canon? <laughs> no. <laughs> what made me want to study voice? Uh, I was bad at the sciences, I guess. Um, no, it was it was one thing that I I, I I was in theater. I was doing a lot of theater in high school. It was mm -hmm. one thing I felt I could do mm -hmm. well. And um, you know, I, I went to my teachers at the time and I said, Hey, you know, if I really wanted to take this to the next step, what would I do? Mm -hmm. Like, in which direction would I go? And, uh, and they said, Well, you could, you know, do a do a theater program, and they're going to train you in, you know, the triple thread, and you'll do all that. But, mm -hmm. but what I would recommend is, is focus on one, mm -hmm. you know, really, really dive into one. And then you can go and do the, you know, once you've focused on one, then you can go back and study all of them, you mm -hmm. know, together. And they were like, and another thing, like, you could try classical music, too. Mm -hmm. Like, have you ever thought about opera? Mm -hmm. And honestly, no, no, I never had. I didn't grow up in that kind of family. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was all kind of new to me. I like started very much from scratch hmm. with my classical music education. In so much that like even my first year of music school, I had to start in the preparatory year because I like I had no fundamentals, like right. no music theory, no keyboard mm -hmm. skills, no anything. So right. uh, you know, I was really starting with the ABCs <laughs> when it came to that. So there was a real deficit trying to feel like climbing back from that because there were people, people I was going to music school with that had been studying for you know, 15 years, you know, <laughs> since they were like little kids. So yeah. 
I had a lot to learn, mm -hmm. and, and I still have a lot to learn. Oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy I get to do what I do because it, uh, <laughs> it is rooted within things that I feel like I know somewhat, uh, which is personal experience <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and my culture and language. Yes. Um, otherwise, yeah, I, you know, I can't, I'm very happy that the orchestras invite me to play my stuff because otherwise, Right. I can't help you. <laughs> you know, it takes me like 20 minutes to read a sheet of music, you know. Right. So those skills are now very far from me. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I had the classical, you know, musical upbringing, mm -hmm. uh, it's, I, I don't make music in that way anymore. Like every time I go on stage with a band, it's pretty much improv. So you mentioned Nina yeah. Simone earlier. Yeah. So yeah. There's, there's someone who had crazy great classical training, could mm -hmm. like do all that, yeah. chose not to do that in her professional career. That was not... Well, or didn't she? I mean, that's that's really the there's a I think a question to be had around her history, right? Because it's like um, she didn't she didn't because she wasn't able to because right. like yes. <laughs> she was uh, rooted in a racist society yeah. that 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 couldn't see a black woman as a classical right. concert pianist. Right. Um, and then, though, didn't she do it anyway? Mm -hmm. You know, I loved when when people would try to put her in a box of like a jazz musician. She's like, I'm not a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. I'm a black classical pianist. Right. And that kind of insistence on like, no, 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 I'm not what you say I am. I'm I'm actually I'm I'm living out this whole other vision right over here. Um, mm. I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that even piece of it right there was also inspiration for me to say, okay, well, like, what does indigenous classical music sound like? It might not sound like anything that we've had come before. It's certainly not gonna sound like Dvorak when he was r trying to write, like, you know, melodies based on indigenous music. Right. It's probably not gonna sound like, you know, any of these early Americans that tried to get their compositions around our sounds. Yeah. It's gonna be something else. And I guess I was just kind of okay with that after a while. And, um, and again, outside genre, Nina Simone just is Nina Simone. Like, no, she's not it. jazz and she's not pop or soul. Like, she's, she's she is a genre under yeah, herself. Yeah, I think when you bring it, when you bring something unique and you're kind of blending and and refusing to be put in a place, mm -hmm. like it's um, then people just know you, and I guess that's that's okay too. So um, before you you got kind of slid into the opera world then, what, what were you listening to growing up? What did, were you listening <laughs> to musical theater? Were you listening to Nia Simone? Or were you listening to Cash Tin? What were you listening <laughs> to? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like uh, kind of all of it, I guess. Yeah. Like, because um, I'm the youngest of four brothers. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of my musical education comes from, from, from those, those ones who went before me, you mm -hmm. know. So that's everything from, from, you know, Thelonious Monk to, you know, powwow music. Like my, my oldest brother was really into like that big drum, plain right. style powwow sound, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I heard a lot of that growing up too. Mm -hmm. And then to classical music, to, you know, folk stuff. So it's kind of all over the map. And I, you know, I guess we're all just kind of, anyone who sits behind an instrument and tries to create something, I think we're all just making sounds that feel good to us based on the context of everything that we've heard prior to that moment, right? right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I guess in a way that was my process as well, was, mm -hmm. was trying to weave together these, these musical aesthetics that at, at, the, at the face of it seem really, really different, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. that of indigenous song making um, and that of classical music. Mm -hmm. And then some weird kind of poppy jazzy right. thing too, and kind of all trying to bring it together into something that's, mm -hmm. all, that's all we can do is just speak from our place of experience. And that for me was this, mm -hmm. this fusion of uh, many different ways of making sound. I, I kind of brought up a name offhand there, but I find Cashton fascinating. Yeah. And people, I, f I feel like they've been written out of history. People don't remember them. People don't talk about them. Cashton were an, a, a band of Innu musicians from Northern Quebec who had pop hits mm -hmm. in their own language mm -hmm. on much music all the time. Uh, Florent Vallon. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And sold like 200,000 records in this country. Yeah. Toured Europe with Daniel Lanois and the Gypsy Kings. Yeah. Like, and that's not, they just, they just seem to be written out of Canadian pop history. And yeah. so when Jeremy Dutcher comes along and everyone's like, this is the first time someone's sung in their own language. Well, this is the thing. We have to be very <laughs> aware yeah. of like of this, right? Because I think the media always wants to tell the new story. Yeah. They always want to have the shiny thing. Mm -hmm. And that 
often really undercuts our, our elders and something that is so key to indigenous philosophy is 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 paying respects to the ones that went before. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not we're like the whole path has been created for us, and to to pretend like you know anything we do is 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 new or revolutionary, I think, is just from our ego place. You <laughs> know, like uh, yeah. if we can understand that everything we do has been has been kind of laid there for us, and it's it is us to it's our creativity to go and put it together and offer it. That, that's not nothing, mm -hmm. but, but truly I think the more we can push back against this idea of genius or against this idea of, oh, isn't that amazing? Well, you know, what is the context of the, that artist or that creator that allowed them to be, mm -hmm. you know? For yeah. me, I'm always trying to point that camera back to, mm -hmm. to people like Maggie, like right. that elder that pointed me in the direction of the museum. I wouldn't be here if I didn't listen to her, yeah. you know, or my mother that insisted like, know your language, mm -hmm. you know, you kids are gonna need this mm -hmm. in the future. So there's, there's all of these like, you know, posts and, and, and directions that have like guided the way, you know, and it's uh, just trying to pay respect to that lineage I think is important. And that's why, you know, I come and sit here, I wanna talk about, you know, a Tribe Called Red, people like Buffy St. Marie too, mm -hmm. you know, who, I think a lot of us wouldn't be, mm -hmm. a lot of us in like in the indigenous music scene wouldn't be doing what we do without her light. And yet her music was hard to find for years before her comeback. Like well, that's, I don't think we can get into no, a whole blacklist <laughs> conversation in, in 10 minutes, but. Uh, but speaking of shifting the camera. <laughs> yeah, what you got? <laughs> we got a room full of people who might have questions. So okay. I'm gonna shift the camera away from of me. Of course, of course. And uh, Alyssa has a microphone, no, Hannah's the microphone. So please, if anyone has any questions. We've covered a lot of ground here, so. Did we? <laughs> yes, right on. Hey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hey. <coughs> Thank you for that delightful conversation. I'm, I'm really curious to know what it felt like to encounter the voice of your ancestors the first time. What, what, was, that, what was that experience? Uh, okay, do you ever, like, um, I don't know if you've ever had this experience in your life. Sometimes, uh, like imagine if this room, this like little library situation with this Massey Hall, Massey College uh, poster in the background, this room was it. And it's just like this was, it kind of levitates and everything around is white and it, this is the only thing that's happening right now. I guess it's a pure moment of presence. And, and that's what I felt. Uh, in, in engaging that because I think also a transference through time it's a bit of a time travel eh? you know as you're sitting there and you're hearing this voice calling to you from over 110 years and, and kind of understanding but kind of not and reaching for something and, and, and to all the time thinking about When you know this anthropologist, he came to our community and put this put this gramophone in front of our ancestors and said, "Hey, sing your songs for me," you know, and the ancestor leans into the bell of the gramophone. Where did he think the songs were going? Mm -hmm. You know, where <laughs> where did he when he sang into that? Where did where did they go? Into the future, <laughs> I guess. Here, I, I, into that room, into that mm -hmm. moment. Um, yeah, so a lot of like really like heady philosophical things, but then also being grounded in that real moment of the, you know, of the drip drip of the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> of the crack in the wall and the, and the, the bad furniture, you know, in this like, you know, kind of dreary museum space. And just knowing that like that voice was calling out and saying like, like, I, I don't want to be here anymore, mm. you know? And so um, it was just a call, you know? And, and, and I, I wanted to show that moment to, to other people. And that, that, that album was the culmination of that. Mm -hmm. Just saying like, hey, look at this. <laughs> look how beautiful this is. I really, and you know what? If nobody else finds it as beautiful, at least I've done my little little accounting of something I saw and I witnessed and I thought was really cool, you know? <laughs> and I guess trying to, because uh, in my mind, like musicians and artists are problem solvers. 
So we see a problem in the world and we just wanna, we wanna share it. It was a problem to me that, that when I sat and listened to those songs, coming from this community, that I didn't recognize these songs. Mm -hmm. And that they felt far from me, even though they were labeled, you know, my language and coming from my ancestors. There had been a there had been a break there, and we don't need to look too much further than the history of colonization and everything that has happened in this country for the last 100 years to to understand why, right? But we're telling a better story now. The camera is going in a different direction, and we're thinking about what we can build. And for me, it's about not necessarily building from nothing or from scratch. Like the ancestors laid it all out there for us. You know, it's in, our lang it's in the roots of our language. So we just got to teach that and show them uh, the way home. Um, that, that was that moment. That's <laughs> what that moment was like for me. Um, but uh, yeah, it was one of those things you'll never, f you just, you'll never forget. And it was like, you see, it was like a moment when you see the mountain that you're about to climb, and it's a little scary too. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing some like, yes, <laughs> this is a highly relatable moment. <laughs> it's probably before you started to come here, you thought, oh, there's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that was. Thank you for your question. I hope that I hope that answered it. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else there over there? I'm I'm curious about the resonance that your work, your songs, have had in your community. Yeah. Because these songs, you said, they were so distant for you, but you made them known to the world, but also to your local community. Are mm -hmm. they singing them now? Mm -hmm. they, do, we, do you see that? Yes, I'm so happy to answer that question and to give you the answer I'm going to give you, because <laughs> um, it didn't have to be that way, and it wasn't, a, it, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that it was going to be received, right? Um, we can have all the intentions in the world uh, around something we create and who we want to receive it. Um, and sometimes it just doesn't, it doesn't reach or it doesn't land. And um, for me, it was about <laughs> making it impossible for it not to because it was so directly oriented towards them. For example, you know, you were talking about, oh, it was hard to find translations, or I don't really know some of these meanings. I, th th there was a reason behind that, mm -hmm. you know. No translations provided, because this is for you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not for you, but like, sorry. <laughs> this is for you, <laughs> Willowstoke people, you know. Um, it was oriented right to you, to have an internal conversation. Um, and yeah, that was, that's been met. I think, you know, I think <laughs> I, I got the most beautiful video um, a couple years ago now. Uh, but one of the, uh, a local choreographer, like he's a, teaching the kids how to dance. And um, when he's like, okay kids, like what song do you want to learn to dance? And they picked one of my songs. Mm -hmm. And he showed me a video of those little ones, those little kids kind of making a dance to one of my songs. And it was like, in that moment, it was like, oh, this is exactly what, you know, whatever, Juno, the accolades, all this stuff I get to go around. And this is, this is the transference. This is what I want to do. Uh, and there's, there's, there's an elder's voice on that record, too. And she talks kind of about this exact thing. She says, you know, when you bring the songs back, it's, it's going to bring the dances back. It's going to bring the people back. It's going to bring the feasting back. It's going to bring, song is just a catalyst. And it is often the first catalyst for something much bigger around resurgence and revitalization. We see that how song plays a role in revolutions around the world, right? It is such a powerful spark. So uh, I had hoped that it would be that. And very much so, it's, it's kind of turned into that. Um, I don't know if my future work is ever going to do that. At this, I can't really, I don't care about that. I can't really measure it by that because this was such a, it was such a spark of an idea. And there was almost no planning around it, which sounds, <laughs> yeah, it sounds weird. <laughs> five years. And like, I don't know what I'm doing. It, that's the thing. It took me five <laughs> years to like research it and write it and, and, and trust, like people worked very hard to like put it out into the world that it would be heard by people. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, there was a certain sense of kind of just trusting that this work is guided by 
ancestors that want to see it in the world, and, and also, it, it also met a cultural moment, too, that it was only possible. This was happening, you know, I think it came out in 2017 or 2018 or something, yeah. and this was just right after the Year of Reconciliation, right? Yeah. It was dubbed by uh, mm -hmm. Sir um, Trudeau II. Uh, that that we had we had had our year of reconciliation and now we have like moved on to the next thing right um, but at least I will say like we were having a national conversation about it you know and there were certainly a lot of people in the music industry that were also trying to push that conversation but it allowed me to kind of step out into that mm -hmm. you know which was a unique cultural moment that mm -hmm. perhaps if it was if I was you know trying to put out this album 10 years ago yeah. would different. not have had the same effect. Very different so um, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a measure of like good timing and just mm -hmm. um, hard work, yes. maybe. <laughs> 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 I hope. God. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do, do we got time for one more? One more cue? Reina, there? Oh, no, there's a couple. Wow. <laughs> Jeez, really? <laughs> well, okay, I'll be around if, too, if you don't get to it. We'll, we'll chat. Yeah, and I'll try to talk fast so you get a chance to. Um. Oh, that's not the problem. I think it's, it's <laughs> me talking, yeah, too much, yeah. Um, Jeremy, I can't start with anything other than thank you, Marcy. Um, <laughs> it's you have blown the world open. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm kind of speechless with gratitude, but I'm going to try to get to the question anyway. Um, you made a really beautiful distinction earlier. Um, and I'm also thinking of song as catalyst when I think back to this. Um, the difference between repatriation and rematriation. Um, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about what that looks like. And um, with both music and with museum in carceral culture, mm -hmm. what does it look like to try to do that more ethically and responsibly and with the spirit of care? Mm, mm, wow. Thank you for that question. That's so beautiful. Um, so just a really quick like semantical distinction between rematriation and repatriation. I was just kind of called out on this one time uh, <laughs> by like an art auntie of, uh, who wasn't from my nation but was from another uh, like adjacent uh, group and she said, you know, if you're going to do this work and you come from a matriarchal culture, don't call it patriation. You're bringing this back home to our, our, our grandmothers. Yeah, I know, exactly. And I was like, yes, exactly that. So ever since then, I just kind of try to um, reassert and, and reaffirm that like, we, are, we are fundamentally matriarchal people. And, um, and, and we erase that sometimes with how we speak, you know, with, with kind of playing by the rules of the game that are set in front of us rather than interrogating that language and saying, Oh, actually, when this comes home, this is coming home to a very different cultural context, one that is not incarceral, you know? And so that might, and that's been the whole kind of conversation, too, is like museums have been really resistant into giving that stuff back because they say, oh, well, you don't have the, you don't have the infrastructure in order to care for it in the proper way that it needs to be handled. And it's like, well, that's by your metric, you know? And we might have a different starting place about like what that even looks like. Like for example, there was, there was one nation that rematriated some of their content back home and that next day they had a ceremony and they burnt everything. They cataloged it and they burnt it. You know, and that's, that is, I don't know, for me I'm like, <laughs> 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 but that is their, that's their absolute right to do it, you know, and how, how dare like we from another try to impose our standard of, of c what care looks like because whatever they're doing in those museum spaces isn't care. It is cataloging and objectifying. Yeah. And I want to see this, this material culture uh, in the hands of our artisans and people that can actually uh, not only take that brilliance that's there but then keep building on it like that layer after layer of artistic um, continuance. Um, yeah, it's a, to loop it back around. <laughs> so um, does, that, does that answer your question? That was just such a, oh, you, you also so beautifully spoke about the, like ethics of care too, which is probably why I wouldn't take them out and burn them. <laughs> um, although that is a kind of release of its own. Anyway, I have a lot of minds about that. But I think doing it in a way of, of care is important as well, but also in a, and doing it in a way that insists that we know what's best for our stuff. 
<laughs> um, doing it in a way that maybe asks um, forgiveness rather than permission, and maybe not even forgiveness, like maybe just takes it. I mean, there's a lot, there's been a lot of, excuse me, uh, of that work that's happened in different museum contexts. There was actually, in the Levi Strauss Museum in, in Paris, a couple years ago, there was some, some physical repatriations of some poles from Africa that were just kind of taken and like, no, we're just taking these home, you know? And, you know, I think about that and like, phew. anyway, they should not let me around museums anymore just because <laughs> I feel like, <sighs> anyway, I'm not going to incriminate myself uh, on the, the internet. Do but we have time for the lightning last question? Yeah. Or <laughs> one's your husband here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I need to put myself together. <laughs> After listening to you, I, I am like, wow. It's profound what you're doing, what you've been able to do. And to put it so succinctly, it challenges me to own who I am, coming from a past that was colonized and told different. I'm profoundly moved. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Can we, right. I, that's the perfect way to end it. I hope, I hope we can do that. Thank uh, you for sharing that. I just wanted mm. to quote Maggie Paul. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's a perfect way to end, never mind. Wow. Who says, it's, this is on the record, it's a quote, she says, the ancestors are so happy you're singing these songs again, they thought they would never hear them again. So thank you for singing these songs. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, Jeremy, Michael, for that amazing conversation. Um, I wish we could do this for longer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but on we have to end this <laughs> now. Um, just so to wrap things up, on behalf of the Masi Massey Music Society, thank you to Joe Costa and Matt Glanfield for producing this event, and to Alyssa Ginsberg for coordinating. And I think this video will be up for um, future viewing, and if you want to share it with others, please do. And I thank you to you who are here tonight to join us and also those of you online. And we hope that you enjoyed this event. Um, you don't have to wait long for the next Massey Music Salon because it's happening in two weeks on Wednesday, November 2nd. And this one is called Parallel Traditions Exploring Classical Music from Northern India. And this event is presented in partnership with Rag Mala Toronto and is part of this year's Focus on India. Junior fellow and Indian classical music trained vocalist Surajit Chakraborty will be joined by renowned tabla player Ravi Naimpali and saxophonist Andrew Kay in conversation with junior fellow and jazz bassist Sam Little. We hope you can join us then. Thank you and good night. Thank you.